The Impact Lounge is the number one place to be for the real Impact Wrestling fans. Hey, what is going on, folks? It is BQ. This is the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. I am joined by Ro the Great, and we're covering TNA Global Force Wrestling. What's up with people still saying that shit, Ro? Like, I just saw it today. Um, you know, people, uh, TNA, GFW, whatever it's called. Impact fucking wrestling. Um, it's been that way for over a year now. No, I shouldn't say that uh, because they did do the GFW thing. But, like, come on. Oh, just trying to be cool. It's no different than when you know when you hear always hear the oh why I haven't watched in forever. So that's why I stopped watching. Like people feel the need to take those jabs and stuff because you know they want to feel validated. So you know to each his own, I guess. If it's your first time here, whatever platform you're listening on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, whatever it is, hit subscribe, follow us. We're doing this each and every week. This is the number one place for news reviews and interviews and more in the world of impact wrestling. I think we're going to have to change the tagline to news and uh, reviews, man, because if I get another, uh, if I drop another interview on YouTube with shitty ass numbers, I'm done with that stuff. You know, like I said, like I, my theory on it is, and I hate to say this, but folks kind of love hearing the same old same. When you think about the teleconferences, Think every time, rest assured, there's some sort of question that revolves around, are you willing to go to said company? You know, who do you want to work with? And I just think, like, you know, the way that you and Adam and kudos to the both of you guys do these interviews, you guys try to present the interviews in a way where it's a different sort of sound, where you kind of get to know the wrestler on a personal level. You know, asking the same sort of questions that they can hear in any other interview, it doesn't make you the interviews that you guys conduct unique. So it's unfortunate that they're not as received as they should be. Yeah. So next time I get on uh, Facebook live, Facebook live, I don't do Facebook live at all. What am I talking about when I do a YouTube live stream, we're going to, I'm going to talk with the listeners. We're going to find out why, 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 why? Cause I cannot upload bad content onto the YouTube channel because it uh, really hurts the growth of the channel. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that, how that works right now, but, um, we're gonna we're gonna get to the bottom of this. We're gonna pull a Stone Rockwell, go on an adventure, and find out why people don't want to hear actual interviews with actual Impact Wrestling stars. The Trevor Lee interview that went up this morning, that Adam did, is really good. Like, it's it's very candid. Because if you've heard Trevor Lee on the teleconferences, he's always in character. And like, this was a real. Did, did you get a chance to listen to it? I know you were work at, at work all day, but did you get a chance to listen to it. I mean, it's a 13 minute interview, so someone can't say it was too long to click on. Yeah, I actually, um, I heard it while I was working out and like, you know, that's one thing I did notice that he was uh, out of character and, you know, it's crazy because he was one of the guys that I kind of was worried about, you know, when we don't see them on TV as much or we see them losing a lot, like, you know, could he be the next one to go and just the way it came across is he's going to be here for at least the next couple of years and he seems really optimistic about his future within Impact Wrestling. Yeah, it, it was really good stuff, and uh, I've already committed to uh, Demon Bunny, uh, Rohi Raju, and then uh, I think Adam is still trying to get Richard Justice, and then Charles is going to get Stone Rockwell. So after those four, um, I, I think we might be done, done so with the interviews on this channel. We're going to see. Um, we're going to get into Impact Wrestling here, of course, and uh, obviously hearing my voice again this week, Adam is is out, so I am back in the place to be. Ro, uh what do you got on this entire episode? Uh, I, I don't really know your thoughts of it. You know that I texted you earlier and I was like, I don't think this podcast is going to be very long because this wasn't my favorite episode in the world. I don't I don't necessarily have any complaints, but it was just it was just kind of like a show. We just turned it on, watched the show, turned it off. It was good. I mean, there was nothing that really just stuck out to me. And you know what? Sometimes it's OK to watch Impact and, you know, t take away from it, like, hey, this was a good episode, you know, on to next week. I don't expect every show to be like oh man remember this 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 that so it went by i mean a couple of criticism here here and there but you know overall solid show when it comes to the impact lounge reviews we're not going to give you a fanboy review of the show our number one goal is to be very positive about impact wrestling but you cannot you know i use this phrase a lot can't have a yin without the yang if we just sit here and praise every single thing they do like some people do what do our words mean and it's like i always talk about till I'm blue in the face on social media about impact using the same 
buzzwords of must see and can't miss and this episode's huge and now the words mean zero. So we're not going to sit here and say, hey, every single thing we saw was great because then what do our opinions, you know, really matter? So uh, we're not going to talk bad. It wasn't a bad show. It was just it was just the show. I really enjoyed last week's and uh, enjoyed talking about it. But let's let's get into this. We're doing things a little bit different now here. We're going to kick off with whatever closed out the show, whether it was a main event wrestling or main event angle, whatever it is. We're going to try to kick off the show that way. So you guys get the most important aspect of the show, and then we'll get into the rest. So the end of the show, there wasn't really a quote-unquote main event. Uh, I think the last match we saw was uh, the knockout title match, but they didn't really build that. No, actually, the six-man match was. Obviously, that wasn't the main event. The focus was Austin Aries and Moose and Killer Cross and... Uh, Really random entrance by, uh, or inclusion, I should say, into this whole thing by Johnny Impact. Eddie Edwards obviously wasn't involved at all because I guess he's injured from last week. So, what do you got on this one, man? Um, I was I was hoping for something a little more entertaining than this. I said last week if Moose came out there and pulled that shit of when I was in the hospital and you didn't call, I I really in my gut didn't think they were gonna do that. Um, they did, you know, that was the same thing with Davey Richards. And I, I would, I'd be willing to bet if I, if I sat and thought about it, they've, they've taken that angle several times over the last few years. I mean, as far as the character, the whole money moves, I, I do like that aspect of it, but really man in, you know, I hate to compare wrestlers, but it just screams Monty Brown. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, like he kind of had a similar path in which he was. You know, dare I say, top babyface ch ch uh, chasing the world championship at the time, and he uh, was unsuccessful in defeating Jarrett, only to later on join Jarrett. So I just worry that this heel turn might doom Moose in the long run. But yeah, and then once again, to his explanation behind it all, it just doesn't make any sense. I think even if they were going to go the route that they were going, they should have waited maybe a couple more weeks before the initial turn but you think about it, we hadn't seen moose since slammer slammiversary only for him to come back and turn against eddie Edwards because eddie didn't visit him it <laughs> didn't make much sense bro if we cut people out of our lives every time they didn't call us when we were down we would have nobody <laughs> exactly you know i mean the average human being has one or two people they can you know you can count on one hand one, you know, people that you can count on that that is, uh, you know, gonna be there for you, and uh, I just, I just find it silly. Here is my my issue with how they did this, is that he came out and obviously did this promo that I was really praying to God he wasn't going to do. But why is he? Did he say why he aligned himself with Austin Aries? I mean, why is he making this about Eddie Edwards? He so he let me get this straight. He aligned with Austin Aries because. Eddie Edwards in it, call him when he was in the hospital? Did I miss something? The one thing he did add on there, and which I thought was, I want to say, uh, uh, I forget the words that we're looking, but it just, it, it seems like he put over Oscar Aries as being superior to, you know, compared to himself, because he was saying, you know, this is the man right here, you know, he's all gassing Austin Aries up, and it just, it seemed, it seemed so phony only because, you know, he was challenging him, you know, not too long ago, and like I said, you know, for him to barely come back and automatically align himself with Austin Aries, it just came across as just uh, phony, like, you know what, I couldn't beat you, so I'm going to join you. I, I see a lot of people, they, they kind of compare it to Kevin Durant. <laughs> yeah, he definitely pulled a KD. I, I uh I, I welcome the, the the I welcome the change in the character though. As I've said a hundred times, I said it last week, you know. You can't go back to the moose chant, can't do it to the NFL. When he was doing the moose chant last week, I thought it was really out of place. You know, I, I really hope going forward if you know he looked like he was dressed like Shaquille O'Neal in the Shazam movie back in the nineties. <laughs> But if he's going to do that, I hope that I would like to hear him come out with new music, see him, you know, don't do the fucking moose. I can already see it in my head. He's going to do it in a real sarcastic way. I I'm willing to bet that's what he does. He comes out. He's like, you know, moose, moose. I I'm I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But I'm still really intrigued by this, even though I'm kind of like complaining about it. I'm really intrigued. I really like 
I love Cross. Love him. Like to me, that guy's flawless in in what he does and his character and how committed he. I freaking turned on. Um, but I'm I'm into the whole thing. So I just want to see what happens next. I just I just felt this was like so cookie cutter in the way that you know they did this. Yeah, I mean we just uh, we have to see. I mean I will say too. I mean you know the Moose's personality. He gives some personality to the group because you know we you know we know what we're getting with Austin Aries and. Killer Cross is usually silent and selective with what he says, you know, his promos, facial expressions and everything. So, you know, we just got to see what happens next. So the opening match of this whole thing was Rich Swan versus Petey Williams. And, and this was the one match last week where I was like, I wasn't really too into it because I just felt, uh, you know, Cage and Phoenix stole the show. And it was it was really hard to follow that up with a with a safer X Division style match. This one was a little bit better. I did like uh, Seidel on commentary a lot. And, you know, usually when you put someone on commentary, it takes away from the match. You know, I still thought the match match was decent, even though he was out there. But I, I just, I love what Seidel's doing. You know, his baby face of, I'm going to be X Division champion when he first came in. You know, that was cool at first. But, you know, if he, if he was still that character, we'd be like, get this guy off TV. You know, like, I'm so glad that they evolved him. The thing that is ridiculous is Josh Matthews. I'm a, I'm a Josh apologist. Don't get me wrong, but I'm talking creatively. Josh Matthews acting like he doesn't know what the hell is going on with Matt Seidel and this third eye shit. Sometimes, like he's so confused, he's almost like, where did the, where where did he even get this from? <laughs> yeah, I know they act they act so weird when they interact with each other now. Yeah, it's like Josh is like this full-on babyface announcer when Matt Seidel comes out. So, I don't know. When that whole thing happened and he was the spiritual advisor, I, honest to God, think that uh, someone else was supposed to fill that role. And I know some people said it was JB, but I think the co the plan was JB and Don on commentary. So, I do think Josh was going to do something else. But I feel like they threw him into this role last minute because it was they never committed to it. And then now he has absolute amnesia to that point in his life you know it seemed like they had on paper it sounded good but then just the execution it probably didn't take off like they anticipated so then they just decided to pull the plug on it altogether. the match however was pretty good i i, I really had no clue who was gonna win and um pd wins we get to see the canadian destro destroyer which is always fun matt seidel distracts him and what the crazy thing is we are getting storylines in the X Division. I mean, this feud has nothing to do with the title other than mentioning that uh, Rich Swan has title aspirations. But it really has nothing to do with it. So and don't you feel like that's a, just a, a breath of fresh air compared to, you know, years ago where it was like X Division titles on the line. We're just going to throw six swinging dicks into the ring and they're just going to do a bunch of planches. And that's it. Yeah, like we praised it last week. You know, it's crazy how they've been able to turn things around. I mean, every now and then we do get the random multi-man match, and I guess that's okay. It's used more in lines of trying to get people on the show. But it's always nice, and you can appreciate when you have these side fuse that don't revolve around the X Division title. So this has me interested to see what uh, Swan and uh, I almost said Eddie Edwards, I'm sorry, Matt Seidel can do together. I found uh, Swan saying, I don't give a damn about your third eye to be hilarious. And I'm going to steal that uh, audio clip at some point. And the, the obvious thing was that they last week, their promo was in the same exact place. So I don't know if it's supposed to be uh, Seidel's little uh, house of worship, if you will. I, I don't know what that is. But obviously, they did the uh, promos back to back and just cut them in half. But... Uh, but it's good. I, they're going somewhere with it, and uh, you know, I don't know exactly. Maybe it's just a, a normal feud, but it's, I think it's pretty entertaining. And the next match was the Desi Hit Squad against Joe Hendry and Grado. So the match, the match was okay. Uh, Desi, I think what hurts the Desi Squad, all, other than Gamma Singh's pronunciation of their names and just bad promos in general, is. It just seems like their matches are always against comedy wrestlers. You know, they fought KM and Falaba like three times. You know, now, now they're in the ring with Grado. 
I feel like that hurts him a little bit because I do feel like the company does want to put the titles on him. I, I hope I hope later than sooner because I don't think they're really ready for that yet. But I do like them. I just I just think they not sure where they're going with it quite yet. You know, I, I think they're still figuring a, a few things out. But the match was okay. Joe Hendry looked great here. He did that uh, follow-away slam on both, um, Ga- uh, I'm not Gama Singh, Rohi Raju and Gersinder Singh. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, before we get to the post-match segment, do you got anything on the actual match itself? I mean, it looked like just to give the Desi Hit squad a win and put them back in, in the win column since they had been on a small, mild losing streak. You know, with the team, I think what hurts them is it's too much inconsistency. And I know a lot of times, you know, whatever occurs on Explosion doesn't necessarily translate to what happens on the actual Impact broadcast. But on Explosion, we see Rohit Raju week in and week out lose, you know, and they they reference him being a part of the Desi Hit squad. And then when I see them together as a tag team, it, it's hard for, for me or, well, I won't just say for me, but I could see it being hard for your average fan who do, might watch Explosion and be like, well, this guy's you know, always loses. So, you know, his this team must always lose too. I think, though, I do like Gersinder Singh, and I think if they ever decide to pull the plug on this, I think they can do a lot with Gersinder Singh. I like him too. I think I think he's impressive. When he announced he was signing with Impact last year, you know, I think he went by Tony Cage in the Indies. I found it kind of weird because, you know, obviously the last name was Cage. So I wondered, what, you know, what is this guy going to do? I, I assumed he was an X Division competitor. Uh, didn't know what they were going to do with him, and uh, part of the Desi Hit Squad. So the post the post match angle was something we, you know, we had said we joked before Stevie Wonder could see this through a brick wall a few weeks ago, I actually kind of, I don't even know if I did it on an audio or, a, a, you know, any kind of podcast or maybe it was on Facebook or maybe it was to myself. Maybe I was talking to myself, but I remember thinking it was also a possibility that Katarina was going to turn on them on, on both of them. That's where I kind of started seeing it going. Cause once I saw Joe Hendry doing the, the videos with Eli for Eli Drake and everything, and they were kind of getting over, I'm like, man, they're not going to turn this dude heel. So, that was kind of my next thought. I thought maybe Katarina was going to turn on. That's kind of what this was. The delivery was not real strong with all this. Um, you know, thank God they were in Toronto. This is what I was thinking, man. Thank God they're in Toronto for this. Because if this were in the impact zone in Orlando, that segment would have been flat as a board. Flat line. But uh, the crowd did give them something. So that's fine. So, but basically Katarina said... Uh, she, she quit on Grado after he lost the match and said that she doesn't love him. She loves Joe Hendry and he loves her. And he did. The, I didn't like his video at the beginning that much. You know, he, he I was wondering what he was going to do about the Desi hit squad. And he referenced him like once and then kind of kind of turned it to Katarina. So uh, this one I didn't really like, even though I'm, I, I love Joe Hendry. You can just binge watch his work on YouTube all day. He's uh he's great. But, uh, yeah, what were you thinking about this one, man? Uh, I really stand by that. If this was done in Orlando, it, it would it would have flatlined. I just wonder where they go next with him because my takeaway was I guess they're going to be a tag team for the time being. And I, I don't think there's any problem with that. But, they're, you know, we have all these tag teams. You know, it's time to start utilizing them in the tag team scene because LAX, and not to get away from what we're talking about, but – Eventually, LAX and what they're doing is going to end. It's time to thrust some new some new blood in the mix. And if they're going with this tag team, hey, there's somebody that I like to see them, you know, competing within the ranks on on a consistent basis and not facing the same teams. You know what's bananas is that we had this conversation months ago where we're just like the tag teams are just LAX and OVE and they got nothing. Now they got this plethora of tag teams. And we discussed this last week. We've discussed it before. Like LAX and OGs didn't need the freaking belts. And I think that's even going to be proven proven even more bound for glory because I don't think OGs are going to win then either. So what the hell are the belts about? Just so they could steal them and tag them and keep them for a couple weeks? Like it, it just would have been – they can't even get Z and E on TV right now. You know, I, I don't know how long they could have had as a, a title reign. They're not really promo guys, you know, but – Man, the, the tag team belts could be could really mean something right now. 
They're not even being defended. They really could have meant something. They could have been on a couple episodes of Impact in this in this uh, episode because you know Desi Hit Squad's in the mix. It does look like they're going Grado and Joe as a team. Uh, came and followed Bond there. I mean, they've they've got a few teams. I think though what they they might do between now and Bound for Glory, and I know we're gonna get into it. They probably might take the belt off of them. But what they what I think Impact has to do is they got to realize that you know some of the talent that they have don't doesn't necessarily need to have their feuds. Uh, surrounding with a title or, you know, having a champion involved. And LAX is a prime example where the titles weren't needed. You, you They should have dropped him. I wouldn't have had him drop him to the OGs, but have him drop it to, some, to somebody who doesn't have anything to do or, or at least, you know, they'd be defended, you know, week in and week out. You know, you imagine, I mean, I'm just just going out on a limb. If the Colt to were champions, we'd probably see them almost every impact, you know, whether they're facing – uh, KM and Fala or Desi Hit Squad or any other team not mentioned, you know, whereas the champions, since they're in a few feud that's been, you know, drawn out feud, you know, we're not seeing the belts defended. We're seeing angles here and there, but we're not seeing the belts defended. I feel like uh, Grado got over her very quickly when they were backstage. I was kind of laughing at the chest slaps, uh, but it seemed like he got over her very fairly quickly. Like if that was my woman, uh, I, I don't say I'd, I'd be over in 30 seconds. I was kind of laughing about this at home. I'm willing to bet, and I have no idea. I'm just soft the head here. I'm willing to bet Joe Hendry's like 10 years younger than Katarina is. Oh yeah, without a shot of a doubt. I think he's the same age as me, and I think she's she's almost same age as me. me. Yeah. <laughs> still looks good though. She still looks she looks good. amazing. You know. I, I had watched her early WWE work and I didn't think she was that attractive. Um, and I didn't, at the time I didn't really like her accent. Now I think it's, it's sexy, but, uh, and she looks amazing now, but I don't know, just some, some women just age nicer, you know what I mean? But when she was younger, I didn't really, uh, didn't really care for her just back in the old winter days and the Katie little Katie Lee Birchall days just didn't totally do it for me, but yeah, she's, uh, she's, she's working with something now. So TNA flashback was next. Bully Ray went beating Jeff Hardy with the help of Aces and Eights. Hogan was out there. I fast forwarded through this. Did I did I see Hogan out there? Yeah, he was. Okay, okay. So we always accuse this GWN flashback of of trying to work the system, trying to uh, appease a certain fan base. And my you know my issue with that with trying to appease that fan base is once you get them to watch the GWN to watch Sting and all them, what do you do with them at that point? Because you're not, there's no plan to turn them into new viewers. But, these, you know, same thing, bunch of WWE guys, you know, any comments on this at all? I was going to fast forward it until I realized the type of match it was and who the people who were involved. Because I remember when Adam and I did a throwback and the Ace and Eights angle, it's a little bit fuzzy to me. I don't remember everything everything of it like you know bits and pieces but if anything it's just like this company made bully ray a world champion i don't think anybody else would have done that and that's the one thing you know when the naysayers and all the people who are really critical of the company at least they give they're giving people opportunities you know you're they giving wrestlers a chance you know, and some people succeed, some don't, but at least the opportunities there. It's not a situation where somebody's coming on board, hey, this is what we have for you, nothing else. And this this was a prime example because, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we're all familiar with him during his time being part of the Dudley Boys. You, No one would have thought of him being a world champion, let alone a single champion. I know he had the hardcore title, but, I mean, who hasn't held the hardcore title? So I, I that was just. I think I held it at one point. Yeah, see, you know, <laughs> and I think a one one time uh, uh, the Godfather, one of his uh, hoes, won it too. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So I mean, that was just my thing. Is just like you know, for all the criticism that you know then TNA got, which and sometimes was fair. At least they were giving people opportunities. I mean, they made a lot of people champion. Some that you could argue didn't deserve to be champion, but they gave them that opportunity where they have that on their resume now because that carries weight. You know, you look at Bully Ray, you know, I don't know where he is now, but you can't say Bully Ray without attaching former world champion to his name. There was a backstage segment with KM and Falaba and Scarlett Bordeaux where they were thanking. She looked amazing there, by the way. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. 
Um, did you see her Canadian Destroyer on Trevor Lee? Yes, I was uh, impressed. <laughs> Definitely. Trevor Lee sold that shit like a champ. Make sure to check the Trevor Lee interview on this channel. Shameless plug. We got the... Uh, I'm going to have the Eli Drake one dropping in the morning, and uh, that, one's, that one's pretty good. Adam really did, you know, really dug into, you know, why'd you resign with Impact? And I, I I think he really asked some questions people want to know the answers to. So it, it was a pretty good interview. So I can't wait to uh, get that one up. I think it was a little longer than the Trevor Lee one, but really good stuff. Uh, speaking of Eli Drake, he did an open challenge, but uh, I don't really have anything further on Kame and Falaba. It's uh, I, I want to see Kame as a more imposing character, but... He is a funny guy, and at this point, I don't know if this is a, and I like to be kept guessing, I don't know if this is a storyline that's going to progress uh, where KM turns on him again, you know, kind of like he did, kind of like we expected, or if it's just going to be a comedy team going forward, but it's just hard to imagine KM as a babyface going forward in the long run. You know, the vibe that I got from this, well, I guess the idea, not to get so much from the fantasy way, but... It would have been cool if maybe if they would have had Scarlett Bordeaux, maybe she offers to be their manager in, in accompanying them to the ring, to their uh, their matches. Yeah, you know what? It's weird because I think on one end, as over as Fala and KM are, one would think like, you know, if you have them capture the tag titles, that's a real feel-good story. And, you know, for two guys that essentially have lost majority of their matches in you know during their time in with impact but i i don't know i just think if you break break them away and you go back to what cam was before i just wondered you know and, and it's all up to what creative has if they'll just dis, you know decide to actually give him something more than coming out and being kind of like the resident bully where you know he's beating enhancement guys but even the mid card people, you know, he's just made to look like a joke. I mean, what? Remember, he lost to Scott Steiner not too long ago, right? Uh, did yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh my God, yeah. See, so things like that, like if that, if that's what they're gonna do, I don't want that for him. So keeping him in a tag team, and like I said, with all these teams, I think if you're a team, your goal, or just like any wrestler, your goal should want to be to be a champion. So for them to be tagging and getting some wins up beneath their belt, that needs to be the goal. And I think with them, with them being over, if they have act, actually do capture the tag titles, it's going to be a great feel-good story for them. All right, but after they finish cutting the promo, Johnny Impact's music comes out. Cuts a very corny babyface promo. They go back and forth a little bit with, with very schoolyard, um, I shouldn't say Austin Aries, but Johnny Impact, very schoolyard type of, uh, very schoolyard type of insults. And, uh, uh, let's him know notifies Austin Aries that he is now the number one contender for bound for glory in the main event, the world title. And we talked about this last week when we took the fan at the fan question. Um, and I said, I said, I felt I had a bad feeling Johnny impact was going to be in the main event of this thing. And he sure enough is someone pointed, gave a stat on Facebook the other day and they weren't even trying to be negative that no bound for glory main event has ever, uh, ever had someone who did not work in the WWE. So obviously early in the career, if we're talking about the Joes and Ang angles and all that, uh, not shouldn't say angle, like uh, Joe and AJ, and obviously they moved on, but the, the past main events when you, you know, you can go back a couple years of Hardy, EC3, Galloway, um, EC3 and Lashley, uh, Johnny impact last year when he took on Eli Drake. I mean, it's, that's why I just felt like they were going to do it again, and they did. I think they're trying to capitalize on the boon, not the boon to bound hunter thing. They're trying to capitalize on Survivor number one, and number two. And this is something that does make sense, though. They're doing the build in Mexico. The Bound for Glory build is going to be in Mexico, so that's a lot of why I said I think Ty is going to return as a baby face and take on Tessa. I think I can see Johnny Impact being a selection because he's he's big in Mexico. 
you know, so I think they're they're going to take advantage of the Pentagon and the Phoenixes and LAXs and and people of Latin descent and people who are popular in Mexico. So I, I kind of see why they did it, but Johnny Impact, Johnny Impact comes out and says, and I think he did this by accident. That's I just signed a contract in the back. Realize how ridiculous that sounded. That there was a contract signing without the champion there and without his knowledge. And uh, I don't know, man. What did you think about this? Because this was um, this was rough, cringeworthy at at best. I mean, you know, first off, let me say this: I have nothing against Johnny Impact. I like him, and you know, I do believe that he deserves to be Impact World Champion. And had this been any other pay per view, or dare I say, some of the special shows that they have, I'm fine with it. I just don't like the fact of having the same challenger competing in a pay-per-view event just for a, a year removed. You know, when you think about last year, he just competed. And at first I said, well, you know, since I like Eli Drake, would I have a problem with Eli Drake if he was the one challenging? And same thing. I feel like Bound for Glory, it's the pay-per-view, even though we both talked about Slammiversary really being their flagship pay-per-view. But Bound for Glory is the usually the pay-per-view that this company has where you know, fine. it's the feel-good stories. You think back, I think the biggest one, and it's crazy when you think about it, two years ago, we saw Matt Hardy capture his first world championship in his career. And it was just a moment everyone was happy because, that you know, we never, none of us ever thought of that. So I just think if you would have plugged in, even if, if they would have done maybe a Moose versus Aries 2 before we got the Moose turn, I think it would have went over better. But having Johnny Impact compete again at bound for glory it just i mean he has to win at this point and then outside of that just the way they introduced it i mean they couldn't give us you know hey next week we're gonna have a number one contenders match maybe you do some sort of multi-man match make it seem like it's important because that's the you know the company dubs this the biggest show of the year for them and it's just like hey you know what i'm i'm the number one contender we're facing that bound for glory it just didn't seem special no not at all and last year, I mean, dude, I will take what he did last year over, I mean, I'll take what he did this year over last year's number one contender match of Johnny Impact versus Garza Jr. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. For the number. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I remember we had talked about that. But at least, you know, and even with that, when you think about something like that, you got to make it seem important. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It seems like when it comes to him, they just keep throwing him a, what, what did you call it? <laughs> so they're lo lobbing him softballs. Yeah, like just, they just keep just feeding him, feeding him. And he comes up short, he comes up short. And I hate to use this reference, but it, dare I say, it's similar to like a Roman Reigns push where the guy keeps losing, losing. I mean, I know he finally captured the belt now, but how many times are we going to see Johnny Impact lose, you know, uh, uh, title match after title match and then to have him compete at Bound for Glory again I just felt like this spot could have went to somebody else but with that said I'm sure the match is going to be fantastic but just the whole way they went about it and you know I will say this my last point is just they probably need to reduce the mic time that that him and Austin Aries has because Austin Aries is going to eat him alive on the mic oh he's going to take him to school yeah and the last thing I'm going to say about it is that the product right now is obviously ed edgier. There was a point where Alicia and Alicia ran in on Austin Aries and Moose and Cross and, you know, demanding to know what's going on. Uh, the first thing I want to say completely random is that Alicia did a great job with that. If that was Mackenzie Mitchell, it would have flopped. Um, and also, I want to say that Mackenzie Mitchell is obviously not with the company anymore. And I feel pretty, ref pretty foolish for recording a apology for uh, reporting some incorrect news when, in fact, I was given the correct news. So uh, I actually had an impact employee tell me the other day, do not apologize for shit because you are very rarely wrong. So just go with your gut and, and <laughs> go with what you're told. So I said, roger that. Um, but when Alicia came in, you know, even she was like, keep eating your damn banana or whatever she said which I thought was cool. Really, really funny thing to just squeeze in there, but you've just got an edgier product and then you got Johnny impact coming out with turd cutter and Oh my God. 
I, I, <laughs> it, it just, you know what? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't fit him well. I mean, I think there's been times where they've had him cut promos in the back, and I think when it's been just something short, he's been okay at it. But that's just not his strong point. I mean, his best work is at it is his heel work, obviously. But they're not going to turn him heel because we have no top baby face. So he's the top baby face, the one that we thought we had in Moose. They decided to turn him. So this is kind of like the cards that you know we're being dealt. Like I said, I think the match is going to be ph phenomenal. I've seen some people you know online that hey they have no problem with that, and that's cool. We all can agree to disagree. I just think I would have rather someone else get that slot. Because I think whoever takes the title off of Austin Aries, that can really make somebody. And I, I guess it can make Johnny Impact because Johnny Impact, too, is somebody who's never won a world title, if, uh, to my knowledge. So, I mean, that's going to be good. But I would just prefer somebody else kind of get that opportunity. Well, he's won the title in AAA. Uh, I don't know about Lucha Underground. I got no idea. I, I want to say yes, but I could be very wrong there. What'd you think of, uh, I, I like the open challenge. I hope this is something that continues. And I think it's, it's, you know, I think it's going to work in Mexico because you could see some of the older Mexican legends, maybe La Parca, Blue Demon Jr. Who knows, uh, come out there and take them on. So could be interesting, but what do you got on, uh, on this here? The, the. Stone Rockwell coming out. He said Impact Wrestling's Adventure Superstar. So looks like, you know, that's probably his introduction to the roster. Obviously, he's a very entertaining character. He's not going to win a whole lot of matches. We we know that. So what do you what do you got on it? I like this for Eli because it gives him some sort of direction up until they realize what they want to do next with him. And I think the open challenge works on two fronts where they can actually have this lead all the way up to Bound for Glory if they want and have him face some mystery opponent. I know some people were talking about maybe it can lead up to him facing Jericho or whoever, I, and I think that's cool, but it gives him some sort of direction. And I like, too, that they can use this as a tool to introduce new characters or new wrestlers on the roster in which Stone Rockwell, and what I found it to be important was the fact that he was able to get promo time. Because we've seen sometimes with these open challenges, somebody just comes out, they don't say anything, they just have their dukes up like they're ready to throw down and then only to lose in a minute. Now, obviously, Stone Rockwell lost, what, I think 16 seconds. He lost relatively quick. Let's be careful there. It's 12 seconds. 12. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My bad. But, you know, the point was, I mean, even though he lost in a quick manner, he we were introduced to him on the Impact roster. And he doesn't just seem like just some enhancement guy. There's something to it. So I, 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 I really like this for everyone involved. You know, they, they, people often say, don't blink and you'll miss something. I seriously turned it, my head to my, one of my kids for a second, and then I turned and he was doing the gravy train. <laughs> so uh, I, la I laughed. It, it, it had me cracking up because right when, when Stone turned around, you know, he attacked him and boom. <laughs> and the way, he, dude, the way Eli Drake was looking at the camera, like interviewing him and stuff. And he's like, well, well, well when, was, when was your last adventure? And he starts telling him, he's like, okay, anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. But that, that was so entertaining. That was really funny. But yeah, it, it definitely gives him something to do. Uh, maybe maybe Sugar Dunkerton comes out. And, and I would imagine he'll probably have a little more competitive of a match. But but um, I, I like it. it, it it's entertaining. Just gives us something you know with him but that's crazy he's doing uh open challenges again uh, you know throwing him a fastball throwing him curveballs and johnny impact is is hitting off a off a tee right now so well i think though to to me and just in my opinion with it i think we're entering the territory with him he's gonna end up becoming face like so much of what i see where his character is going screams that i don't know if you remember the rock during in 99 where he was like, even though he started off still kind of heel, he was still um, garnishing those uh, face chants, and then eventually he just became face. I think that's the way that they're going, and I think his next title reign will be will impact world title reign. He'll be a face, and he will be one of the ones that has a long title reign. Maybe that's just optimism on my end, but it's just what I'm seeing with him, and I'm you know I don't see too many people booing him now. So I just I think that's the long term booking plan for him. 
man, someone came out in one of the matches, and I try to remember. I didn't write it down. Someone yelled something really funny from the crowd during someone's entrance. Damn, damn, damn. So it was. It got quiet for a second. Someone said something. I, I'm gonna have to figure out what that was. Lucha Brothers. Lucha Brothers cut a promo. I really liked this. I liked that. Uh, you know, they were able to incorporate the English and the Spanish, and then just the special effects that I do. That they. Sorry, just the special effects that they do. It makes it. You know, gives it some mystique. And that's why so many people are really disappointed with all this news. Well, these guys might end up in, in WWE, you know, and I'm sure they would thrive on the NXT brand, but if they, they were ever to go up to that main roster, you know, imagine them backstage with whoever the fuck they, they hired that week to do backstage interviews. And you know that um, uh, Impact used to do this a little bit, but they don't do it anymore. But like when they're, when the wrestlers are like randomly walking around backstage and kind of turns into a little comedy segment. I could see those fucking Pentagon walking back there. And I just, God, I hope that never happens. But this was really perfect. They found the right way now to deliver a Pentagon promo, which they were, didn't, they didn't know how to capture that magic when he won the title. So uh, props on that. You got any comments on that? Yeah, no, nothing at all. I think this was, you know, they always do great work. And I mean, I see now that he's incorporating Phoenix now in some of these segments so i'm interested to see what takes place with the three of these because you know they pretty much were trying to get brian cage to join them and you know we haven't gotten i don't i I didn't really catch brian cage's opening promo but you know we gotta wait to see if he decides to join them just for the moment as they go to war with ove you know i actually thought at um it seems like they're going to do Sammy and Brian Cage at Bound for Glory. But when Sammy Callahan, he said this later in the night, said, we're the best trios, that made me feel like they have a six-man match for Bound for Glory with a tag team from the Mexican scene. Um, so now I, I, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. Uh, speaking of Bound for Glory fantasy booking, I, I'm calling this right now, I think... Cross and Moose are going to take on Eddie, and I think they're going to bring Davy Richards back for a night. I think we're going to get those guys against the Wolves. That wouldn't be too bad. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I was joking with some guys on Facebook because they were like, "Well, no, he's happy being a paramedic." I was like, "I live out here. I live in Saint, near St. Louis. Like the paramedics are making like fifteen dollars an hour there. Like that dude's not." turning down a wrestling payday for a night of <laughs> I mean, it might yeah it might be you know just a one-off you know to have you know just a tag in his corner but uh uh yeah that, that'd be interesting you know for a show like bound for glory we need to have those type of surprises where they go out all all the stops and i think that's a great way to do it so talked a little bit earlier about moose and aries and cross backstage and everything i really like that i think Alicia's just really good at that i hope they can find a way to make her successful in the ring too but um that whole thing was was pretty cool so knockouts title match we got tessa blanchard versus sue young you know i enjoyed this but uh they definitely weren't on the same page uh, you know tessa's a, a a better worker she's a better worker than just about anybody but you know there, there was a little i don't want to call it clunkiness or sloppiness because that's not what it was but there it was just a little disjointed at times and I thought Tessa got a lot of offense in early, you know, a little too much. Um, but but then after that, I think they balanced it very well. And, and, and a heel, I don't enjoy heel versus heel matches, but uh, but I thought they delivered this one pretty well. And you know, I I thought it was okay. You know, you know, people say they want to see a little bit more from Sue Young, but I feel like she plays her character well. And you know, she she did take some chances. You know, she did that. Um, rolling sent on type of move out on the outside on the chairs, you know? So, so I thought, I thought it was pretty good. She, uh, the ending was a little, you know, sometimes Tessa does that move so quickly and the DDT, the buzzsaw didn't look very good last week when Tessa was cutting a promo and she's like, and that's why they call me the buzzsaw. I was like, who the hell calls you the buzzsaw? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so what the fuck are you talking about? And then when she wrestled later, I said, Oh, well, Don Callis gave her the move, the, the name, the buzzsaw for the, the DDT, the hammerlock DDT. So, ah, okay, okay, okay. Now I'm tracking, but I was just like, fucking random as shit, Tessa. But, uh, 
But, you know, this match did get some time for a knockouts match. What, what were your thoughts on this one here? Well, first, I think them calling it the buzzsaw, to me, it uh, reminded me, it, I think they're trying to use kind of like with Raven, his was the even flow DDT, so the buzzsaw DDT or just the buzzsaw, that was just my thinking. But I really enjoyed this match, and it had me wanting them to continue a program with one another between Tessa and Sue Young. Like, if anything, I'm going to tell you, and nothing against her, I really hated the post-match angle with Ali and Kiera coming out to try to aid Tessa. It pissed me off because I'm like, like I feel like she's not needed. Why can't we have Tessa and, and uh, damn, I almost called her Gail Kim. My apologies. Have Tessa and Sue Young uh, continue a little, a little program. I mean, it doesn't have to be too long, and then we can go back to revisit the Ali and Tessa feud. So... Yeah, but I, I really like this, and it just comes to show you sometimes when you having people mix it up or having the champion mix it up with various wrestlers, it freshen thing it freshens things up a bit, and that's what just what was my biggest takeaway. I really want to see them feud together, continue feuding with one another. Yeah, and they're crossing too many women over into this at once, and that's what makes it difficult like that. And that's why I kind of came up with the Taya thing for Bound for Glory because they they got no other opponents for her. She's either beat everybody or, or has, has mixed it up with them. And I don't think it's going to be Kiara. I'm not a huge Kiara fan. I mean, she's cool. Uh, and I think she has a good future. I'm not a real huge fan. I, I, I don't – I think her inclusion with, with Allie is really awkward. I know Adam says the same thing. I, I can't help but to think about several, year, several years ago, several months ago on a one-night only, um, Allie was kind of paired up like that with uh, Ava Story. And Ava Story nailed that shit. She was uh, kind of acting like Allie. Nailed it. Perfect. Uh, absolute chemistry. And um, I just don't think they have it. Like, it just feels like they're just throwing her out there to put her on TV. Uh, or to put her ass on TV. I don't, I don't know what it is. Even though her hair is badass right now. It, lo it looks freaking great. But I don't... They're just throwing too many people out there once. Uh I do got to ask about this angle because on my version of the show, it cut out as soon as uh, it went to commercial as soon as she put Tessa in the coffin. And then when the commercial came back, Tessa was yelling at Allie. Okay, so what happened? First off, they had Casey Spinelli. She was the uh, um, one of the I, I don't know if she always does. She always works as one as one of the bridesmaids. She always wears those knee pads. I know that it's funny. She's like in her wrestling gear. I think that's hilarious. But um, yeah, she she um, I don't think she was in Orlando. But in uh, this whole set of taping, she she, excuse me, she has been. You know that would be a not a nice story if they do decide to sign her on, where they have her break away and become her own person. But um, pretty much what happened was they come out and Su Young gets the panic switch on Tessa and she drags her in the coffin, and then Ali and Kara come out to fend Su Young and the rest of the bridesmaids bridesmaids off. And Tessa was, you know, gets out pissed. Like, I didn't need your help. I don't need you. And then Allie kind of gave the look like, really? We, you know, we helped you. I, like I said, for me, I was pissed off because I just felt like it wasn't needed. I mean, you could have teased the coffin angle and then, you know, have it go away. But like I said, it, it kind of just brought it back to go, going back to Allie again. You know, we know that's w the the end game where they they want to go. But why can't we get Tessa and Sue Young for a couple weeks before we go back to Tessa and Allie? I got, I got no interest in that, um, personally. I think they need to keep Sue Young off TV for a little bit and um, find out what's next for her, because she's another one. She's got no one to work with next. So, um, depending on when Rosemary comes back, but I mean, I get it. Ali said she promised no one was ever going to go back in the coffin. So, I mean, she she kept her promise. I it, it's funny because when she said that, I was like, yeah, they're going to drop that in like two weeks, you, you know. And, and it's funny. That's exactly what happened, but tail Tessa was a, a fucking star this whole time. Every time she was yelling at the ref and everything she was saying and, and the, the look of conviction in her face. I mean, she's, she's killing it out there and she looks a lot more attractive right now than when she debuted. It's a, uh, when her, when she lets her hair down like that, it's better than when it was like kind of tied up to the sides and everything. It's, it just, it just looks a lot better this way. But, uh, but yeah, she she looks like a freaking beast out there. She she's just killing it with uh, what she does. Um, the backstage thing with LAX and the OGs, I, <laughs> it was so bad it was good. But it was uh, you know, th those three the the crime bosses or whatever, 
it was funny because they showed, you know, them answering the phone where, where uh, King is just like, yeah, okay. Like, you mean yes, sir, motherfucker? Like, I mean, think of it, thinking back at it, you know, but um, it was cool. I mean, it's it just kind of funny that, like, King on one hand's back, you, you stabbed, you killed, you robbed, whatever. And then the bosses are like, we will settle this in the ring at Bound for Glory, you know? Like g- going back to wrestling, you know, like it, <laughs> just kind of kind of cheesy. But at the same time, it was good. And we're getting LAX and Conan. I liked how King started cracking up about <laughs> Conan being in the match. Uh, LAX and Conan versus the OGs and King. I'm glad to see King in the ring. I don't know if this is going to be. I hope this is not the third street fight. But but uh I could I could see like a um I know always I feel like I say this all the time I can see a broken de- final deletion type of match for it. I really don't think the OGs are going to win. I think they are going to lose again, and we're not going to see them again, which is unfortunate because King is King deserves to stay on. Uh, I can't say the same for Homicide Hernandez just because they're not. I mean, what are you going to do with him going forward? This is the one thing I found really really funny, and you you find you know. Sometimes you think about it, you find little loops in the storyline. Do you remember when King uh, first showed up? He was like, there's a chain of command. Conan, Homicide, myself. Yet with the OGs, he's in charge all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, Homicide's supposed to be above him in the chain of command. Yeah, there's inconsistencies. I mean, but I mean, it's okay. But yeah, I'm with you, man. Like, if that does end the feud like their feud ends at bound for glory i want them to find a way to keep king on now i don't know if that's as far as a mouthpiece or have him compete in the ring i've of the mindset that he needs to be the person that causes lax to tag titles whether it's some type of interference or something where that can carry you know add more fuel to this feud because when you look at it what incentive does lax have to keep feuding with ogs when they've beaten them every time they face them so, you know, for this big match, this is supposed to be the end-all, be-all. So, you know, we needed to see the OGs or King do something to them where that's really going to want to give LAX kind of like that extra motivation. Like, let's put these guys out. Because, I mean, they've just, you know, been they've been on the upper hand as of, uh, as of late when you think about the matches that they've competed in. But, uh, yeah, I, I hope they really find a way to keep King on board because I think you, since he's come back, man, and it just gets you mad because you think about when he was part of that whole DCC stuff and how he was utilized then. Like, why couldn't they do this then? Yeah, totally agreed. He could have been their mouthpiece quite easily. After this, we get OVE versus Ace Austin, Trey Miguel, and Zachary Wentz. So I'm familiar with Zachary Wentz. I've seen the – oh, he's been on Impact before, more as a jobber. And I've seen him compete – uh with uh, Desmond Xavier as the Rascals at AAW. So this is interesting. Would you believe me if I told you this match was under four minutes long? No, it seemed it was, It seemed like it went by relatively quick. Like, it seemed, if you to- would have told me X Division versus OVE, I think that's the, the best title for it, really. But it was just, I mean, you could. it was a quicker match, but they did so much. I just, when I saw the length of the match, I was like, holy crap. That was uh, the time of a squash match, pretty much, you know. But these guys got a lot of offense in. The opening sequence made them look like jobbers. But other than that, they did some real indie darling type of shit. And I don't know if this is, you know, these guys are, Zachary Wentz also obviously took on Matt Seidel not too long ago. I don't know if these guys are sticking around. Or what? But they didn't present him as jobbers. I mean, shit. They even came with their own music. Well, Zachary Wentz had music and a and a jumbotron, big screen entrance. So, I don't I don't know. I I don't know the uh, the scoop on these guys. But the match was uh, pretty good, wouldn't you say? Yes. Um. I really like that guy. He was dressed as like Gambit. I think with the um. Uh, I want to say is that Ace Austin or I uh, I don't know. But nice little sprint and. I like that OVE was able to get, uh, as far as the Chris brothers, they were able to get their stuff in because I always think that's important. Sometimes they kind of get lost in the background when you have Callahan feuding with whomever Callahan's feuding with. So, and OVE's just not no, 
you know, Joe Schmo tag team. They're former tag team champions. So, you know, every now and then it's good to kind of remind people of that. I think Dave Chris is excellent. I mean, people are acting like Jay Chris. Uh, Jay Chris is like the standout of this group. And, the, man, I don't see any difference in the two of them. I, I really don't. I, I think they're very on par with each other personally. But Yeah, they, they – you know what? I think for Jake, where Jake gets a lot of credit, he's always the one doing some sort of cutter. And I think when you think about the one that he did to um, Moose at uh, – was it Reed Def- – no, I'm sorry, not Reed Def- Redemption. Uh, and then uh, when you think about the one that he did, I want to say a couple months ago, in that six-man tag to Rich Swan, that, that cutter is just the timing of it. But, yeah, they're they're on par with one another. I mean, they're, they're a good tag team in um, – it's nice that, you know, they're giving us every now and then some matches that gives them an opportunity to showcase what they're able to do. But, you know, I just kind of wish that they made them seem somewhat stronger at times just for being former tag champions. The the, the cutter is becoming the super kick, man. I, I, I just that that move doesn't do anything for me anymore. Uh, I, I have to say I hate their new theme song. Yeah. Yeah. Hate it. <laughs> now, the. I like the O V E like I like that, but the other song was good. Yeah. I thought, I thought the other song was really, really you know, had a lot going on. Like this is just a bunch of freaking noise. <laughs> like death metal, the pig the pig squeals and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think it Oh, I, I think it fucking sucks, dude. Like I'm not gonna lie. I, I I hate it. Like it's I used to enjoy their entrance. Now I'm like, hurry up and get to the ring so I don't have to freaking hear this anymore. But this is gonna be interesting to see if um these three guys, man, they, they really screamed X Division and where we want to see the X Division go. You know, maybe they're the guys that just do random matches, you know, but uh, for what they are, they're they're excellent. I've heard of the guys. Let me not act like I don't know. Sh- don't keep my ear to the street at all. Like, I don't know shit. I've just only seen Zachary Wentz wrestle uh, and not necessarily on Impact, but the other guys I hadn't seen. Um Okay, I think that's it, man. Hey, the one thing I wanted to add before we close out, and tell me if you have a problem with this, and it's not so much I have a problem, but it just kind of makes it, it kind of diminishes what you know what a finish is supposed to be. You notice an impact, everyone does pretty much everyone else's moves. Like, I mean, you see, like, because in Tessa's match, Tessa did a cutter. I mean, we know the super kick. Uh, nobody really does a super kick. But, like, the shooting star press, that used to be a move of... Um, Matt Seidel's, I mean, obviously, before he became heel, everyone does that. Like, it seems no move is is uh, uh, attached to one wrestler. Like, anyone can do anyone's moves. I mean, just like you were talking about the cutters like the super kick, you can add in the Death Valley driver with that, too. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's a move we talked about this before, that, that spinning, even though it's a badass move, uh, that spinning neck breaker, like Fisherman... Uh, Tyson Kidd used to do it, and now it seems like half the knockouts do it. Uh, Braxton Sutter did it. Kira does it, right? Yeah, but she keeps the leg hooked. But uh, there's another knockout that does it. I, I, I totally forgot, but it's man, that shit is so overused. I don't know if you caught this. It's the last thing we're going to do, and we're going to wrap this up. So at the end of the match, there was a um, there was a sequence that apparently didn't go right. This is when. Uh, I don't even know if it was at the end when when uh, everyone started diving outside the ring. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Just, okay. At one point, Sammy Callahan was in the ring, and he was supposed to be out of there. So he rolls out of the ring. Was it to take the dive? To take the dive, yeah. Like, <laughs> but, but but he, like, rolled out and then, like, couldn't get back up. <laughs> you know, like, he was all slow. <laughs> I mean, I was like, oh, I caught, I, I 100% caught that. I know they tried to be slick, but he, uh, he, he just kind of rolled out, couldn't get back up, and then uh, he missed, he missed the dive, like he wasn't there for the dive, so he came too late, so he didn't get involved, but he still couldn't get up off the ground. You know, but you know, give the fans credit, and the one thing that I always appreciate with the fans, we don't give these wrestlers too much flack when they mess up. I mean, we might acknowledge it you know whether we're discussing on a podcast or um, you know maybe on social media but it's not blatant disrespectful like you think about in other companies where the uf'd up and you know they really go all hard in when somebody makes a mistake like you gotta understand you know they're performing on tv 
You know, you're going to have mishaps. So, I mean, at least, you know, he tried to improvise, you know, something that he missed instead of not being there at all, you know? Yeah, and the last thing I want to say is I, I do not enjoy Jay Christ uh, imitating Sammy Callahan at all. Yeah, me neither. I, I don't I don't like that. But uh, whatever. We're not we're not creative. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. I am BQ, and for Row the Great, we are saying peace, and we will talk to you next time. Hey, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Check out the video below for more Impact Wrestling-related content. This is the Impact Lounge.